so happy to be with you today. This is Andrew Phipps, and I appreciate the opportunity of getting the opportunity to share with our Faith, Family, and Freedom a program with you today. I've often thought of the triumvirate of faith, family, and freedom. I want to talk just a little bit today about our family situation. I think it's very incumbent upon us to, tr to be role models and good parents. I think so much in today's society cannot be corrected unless we have a parental overview that allows each one of us to determine and see the real importance of the family. Unfortunately, so many people maybe are not able to grasp that understanding. We live in a misguided age, so to speak. We live in a time of deception. We live in a time when it seems like the family unit is denigrated. When folks could care less about the structure of the family, we've just gone from where folks don't even regard the marriage ceremony, where it was, uh, you know, I think in my own parents and those uh, around when I was growing up, most of the people back then, they had a very strange belief, according to standards today, they thought we ought to get married and then live together. Now, I know that may seem like the Stone Age or it may sound like something from the Neanderthal period, but that seriously was part of the prevailing values that uh, in which I grew up. You see, our values, they shape our actions. Our actions determine outcomes. The outlook determines outcome. If we go into the family and we see where that the children are basically being reared with a single parent, it doesn't take a rocket scientist very long when you look at the data, when you analyze the statistics to find out there is a very great corollary between homes that are in disarray, homes where there is no dad, homes that where there is no structure, and to see kids that are very aimlessly with no direction in their life. No wonder they have little interest in school. No wonder that in many of our larger cities, SAT scores and achievement scores have gone through the bottom, through the basement, so to speak, because the kids basically don't have anybody that's helping. There's many times no parent that's overseeing the homework or getting the kids to school on time or making sure that they're properly dressed. Lots of times children leave for school, especially at the secondary levels, and they wear clothing that is not appropriate, that's not fitting, that's not becoming to people that would want modest apparel. Oftentimes parents let that go without any kind of uh, overview or without any kind of uh, authority. You know, the children are under or should be under the authority of the parents. The parents should not be dictated to but what the children want. And I think it's an unfortunate thing today that many of our good Christian families have left good, stable, Bible-believing churches. They've gone to other places simply because the grandkids started going there. The grandkids may like the music or they may like the way the dress code is or if there is one. And so oftentimes grandparents will say, well, I go over there to be with the grandkids. And you could believe that up is down or down is up, but it doesn't make any difference. So many ch churches today that have removed any kind of an identity off of their signs. You don't know what they believe. I'm not sure they do. But we go in those directions and we have little knowledge of what is being taught in not only in the schools, but we have very little knowledge of what is being taught in the churches. You see, doctrine, doctrine is everything. If the doctrine doesn't matter, 
the details don't matter. It doesn't matter, you know, if you believe that uh, you could go to heaven by riding maybe in a boxcar or something, you might think that's a, not a bad idea, but it won't get you there. You see, we have put truth upon the altar of convenience. As I've said probably more times than I could count, truth becomes hate to those who hate the truth. And you tell people the truth, and folks, oftentimes they don't like it. I know at reading in the account, I believe it's in the book of Acts, where the apostle was uh, there and uh, he was on his journeys and uh, people wept when he was uh, getting ready to leave. Later on in his epistles, he said, uh, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. Now you don't like me because I tell you the truth. It's better to attend a church where the Bible is preached as it is, to folks as they are, and to go to a place where there is a feel-good, blend-in type service where there is no emphasis upon Bible doctrine. The Bible is not to be governed or interpreted by what the church thinks it is. The church is to be governed by what thus saith the Scriptures. If the Bible says it's right, it's right. Conversely, if it's the Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong. My opinion does not matter. I've heard people say, well, the Bible says it and I believe it. Well, I believe the Bible, but whether or not I agree in that particular scripture of the Bible is still truth. Christ is not our co-pilot. I wouldn't want to get in a plane and be a co-pilot to somebody. I don't know anything about that. Christ is either first or he isn't. He is the pilot. He is the one that's in control. We don't leave the teachings of the church up to the preacher or some other authority. We don't let him decide for us what we ought to believe. This Bible is of no private interpretation. No man can say this was only revealed to me or that I got a revelation. If it's not consistent with the Word of God, discredit it. Leave it alone. If somebody says something and you can find no basis for it in Scripture, their feelings does not matter one iota. They can say, well, I thought I got this in a dream or a revelation. Again, if you can't back it up in the Bible, by thus saith the Word of God, you can throw out that material. You can throw out that belief system. We must teach and preach the Bible line upon line, precept upon precept. You can't take Scripture out of context and then make it applicable to something else where there's no relationship. If you did that, you could have a verse of Scripture saying that we do all kinds of things with which there is no basis simply because you isolate that Scripture and take it out of its proper place. In every Scripture, we ought to know who is doing the talking, what is the subject, where is it being discussed, and why is it being brought out. And we'll be back in just a few more minutes. and Freedom Broadcast seemingly are just really doing well. And we hope for the glory of God and to help people maybe have confidence and uh, know that we've been an exceptional country. And my, we have had wonderful guests from time to time. And today is no exception. We have Pastor Jared Shoemate from Valley View, Valley View Baptist Church, Knoxville, Tennessee, and I got to say something because I have relatives in West Virginia. You hail from that great, what is it, uh, West Virginia Mountain? Mountain Mama. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mountaineers West, always free. West Virginia is a beautiful state, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. It is, boy. Yeah, but I'm thankful to be here in Knoxville, Tennessee, the place where the Lord has brought me, and, and I'm thankful for how the Lord is 
is still working and still alive and saving souls. Amen, amen. You have a heart for that, don't you? Uh, yes, sir. As all the pastors that I know do. And uh, what do you think, Brother Shoemate? I'm going to mm -hmm. make this open-ended. We're Sure. You know, we... We see a lot of disillusionment. We see people discouraged. We see people depressed. What's the antidote? Well, the Lord, no doubt, is the antidote. And to describe the situation, let's be reminded that the most victorious moment spiritually for all of humanity was at a very weak moment when our Savior was pinned to a cross as He's given His life. Oh, yes. And here we are in a, in a desperate moment in human history. And I believe that revival is still possible because God is still able. And that is the answer. That's the only answer. Spiritual awakening? Absolutely. What would that bring us? Oh, it would bring us revival. It would bring us to a place in which we know God as a nation again. And until we know God as a nation again, I don't think we have any hope for improvement in our society, for our nation, or for our culture. So you're thinking the laws and bureaucracies and all like that will not accomplish what a spiritual awakening would do. Only God. Only God. Yes, sir. Can we have that? Yes, we can. How do we get it? We've got to turn to Him. What does, that, it, what does that mean But we turn to Him? Well, I'd like to say it this way. The framers of our Constitution felt that individual liberty was important. That was the reason for it all, that we would be a government uh, for the people and by the people. And if we are going to turn to God as a nation, it needs to begin individually. Collections of believers in God's house that beg for God's mercy are honest about their own sin and seek reconciliation with a holy God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And until that happens, in the church house first and individually, I don't believe that we'll see it nationally. And it means to turn from our wicked ways? Yes, sir, absolutely. Could we say they're wicked? Oh, they are, yeah. You know, I heard a fellow the other day make a good statement. He's a good preacher, very good preacher. He said, we're not talking about being sinless, but we're talking about sinless. I like that, don't you? Sure. Brother Shoemate, you stay in the fight, will you? Yes, sir. West Virginians never give up, right? That's they don't right. even quit. And when they come to Knoxville, they get better, right? <laughs> That's what they say. Yeah, God bless yeah. you, brother. Thank, Thank you. you. Gerald Wolf and the Greater Vision have been around now for many, many years. They have some great songs that they enjoy singing, great songwriting by Rodney Griffin, and they sing it meticulously. You know, they in this particular selection, they feature about the miracles that the Lord Jesus Christ did, the many miracles. Let's enjoy with all the many miracles, greater vision. God gave the bold command to cross the Jordan and take the land. Not to worry about the giants they would face. But when the spies returned to tell the others what they had learned, they said, for us to win, there's just no way. Still two of them trusted God. Caleb and Joshua. They said, children, don't believe what you have heard. We know we're out man by far. They're much bigger than But let's not forget just who it is we serve. With all the many miracles, why don't you think it's possible? With all the many things we've seen, why do you think it's just a dream? With all the things 
he's done for us. Don't you think it's time we trust? Remember what is possible with all the many miracles. Like when we were about to die, manna fell from the sky, and water came from a dry old dusty rock. And back when Pharaoh was closing in, God closed the sea again, but not before we all had safely crossed. So here you are, my friend. You face a battle you cannot win, and you tell yourself there's just no need to try. Consider how good God's been. He's been faithful. If you'd like to have any of our products, we do have a Faith, Fame, and Freedom handbook. We have some DVDs. We did one with Pastor Jim Scudder in Washington, D.C. a little over a year ago. It's called Can You Find God in D.C.? I think you will enjoy the beautiful programming that was done in the Jefferson and Lincoln Memorials and other places. If you want any of our products, just call us or get in touch with us as would be indicated there on the screen. forefathers, they came across to this continent, came to America in search of freedom, the freedom to believe God and to worship Him according to the dictates of conscience. And you know, I think today that we should not forget that. It bothers me that I don't have a greater understanding of the Word of God. We need to be able to study to show ourselves approved. And that fault is upon each individual like it's my responsibility. I'm to read and to study. I'm to try to get familiar with the Scriptures. That's why I believe in the King James Bible that much has been lost when we go to other versions. For example, memorization goes out the door in those instances. For example, you know, you couldn't go to Shakespeare and change up Julius Caesar with modern day idioms and modern day languages and it still be considered Shakespeare. I believe that the very God who inspired his word preserved it and I believe that we can depend upon that. Again, in our educational process, we just need to let the Word of God speak to us. And I know it's spiritually discerned. It's not, it doesn't make sense many times or most times or usually to the unsaved individual who knows nothing about it. This Bible is a spiritual book and we have to know the author. And so when we try to read it and we have no way of spiritual application, we can get in a quandary in a hurry. But I believe that the Lord took ordinary people, and revealed His words to them, and gave it to us so that we could have today. You know, I believe it was Wycliffe, William Wycliffe in the 1500s that was burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. When I think about how that Obadiah Holmes in Boston I believe it was around September the 7th in the mid-1600s that Obadiah Holmes was whipped by the authorities for not having a license to preach. That was his crime. Didn't have a license. He uh, had conducted a service in a friend's home, and there were two of his buddies with him. One was... Fined, I think maybe five pounds. Another one was fined much more. But Obadiah Holmes 
sentence was 30 pounds, which would have been a lot of money in the 1600s. Obadiah Holmes, he had people that stepped up and said, we'll pay your fine, but he refused it. He said, I'm willing to suffer for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so consequently, he took the punishment. Well, the magistrates had the flogger or the man dispensing the punishment. He stripped Obadiah Holmes of his shirt and put 30 lashes upon him. And for weeks, he could not lie down. He had to kneel on his knees to get any rest. But you know, his remarks were, he said, you have struck me as with a rose, saying in essence, I know you have beaten me savagely. You have flogged me. You have taken the skin right off my back and off of my limbs. But it felt like you were beating me with a rose. Here was a man that was willing to stand for what he believed. I think of others like George Whitfield, who died, I believe it was, in 17 and uh, 54. He was only about uh, 40 some years old. And uh, George Whitfield preached his last message at a place up in Connecticut. And I've been privileged to go there. George Whitfield, they wanted him to preach. You know, back in that day and time, the villagers and the people would come and they'd ask for somebody uh, like George Whitfield, who had a tremendous voice to preach to them. And he had preached and preached and they wanted more. And he finally said, I will preach until this candle goes out. Well, he did that. He walked to the head of the stairs there to the second floor. And that's where they found George Whitfield. I think about his contemporaries, men like Jonathan Edwards. I think about those men that came and part of that Black Robe Brigade later in the 1800s, men like Shubel, Shubel Stearns that went down the Sandy Hook, North Carolina, had churches down there, and from that spread such a wonderful display of the Bible as it was advanced into the hamlets and villages and the areas and the gospel was preached throughout the Carolinas and down through that geographic area. These folks did not choose the easy way out. They were Christians. They were interested in freedom. By the same token, the Baptist preacher John Leland in the writing of the Constitution in the Bill of Rights, Amendment Number One, John Leland, under a tree, went and had a little conference, you might say, with James Madison, the Virginian, who had written much of the Constitution. And John Leland insisted that in the Bill of Rights that were ratified after the Constitution was in effect, two years later in 1791, the Bill of Rights were part of that as part of the first 10 amendments. And in the first amendment, it was such, of such paramount importance that James Madison, with the encouragement and the leadership of John Leland said, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Never was it intended that the church was not to have any influence in the state. That was not the case at all. They simply were saying, we don't want the state to control the church. We don't want states flogging men like Obadiah Holmes for the simple fact of preaching in a friend's home. We see some instances of that today where churches have been shut down, where pastors have been fined excessively, even for singing. My, what a abrogation of the Constitution. It's so horrendous that it's difficult to find the adjective that would describe such a despicable situation. But we must 
pursue. We must resist at all costs. We must go to him who gives freely to all people and upbraideth not. We must go to the Lord for wisdom. We must seek his wisdom. We must pray. We need as a nation to turn from our wicked ways. And when we have done that, we were told that he would hear from heaven, forgive our sins and heal our lands. That's a great promise, isn't it? I think you'll find that in Second Chronicles 7.14. And it's a general application that I think people of all ages can, can exercise and it be right in the proper dispensation. Friends, if you enjoy this kind of program, be sure that you tell others about it. Help us maybe to get into another station. If you as a church person or a pastor would feel that what we're doing is worthy of support, we would be happy for you to contact us at the information that's displayed from time to time on the screen. I'm a member of Liberty Baptist Church, 9601 South Cowan Road in Muncie, Indiana. I look forward to being with you at the next occasion. And this is Andrew Phipps. Phipps Faith, Family, and Freedom, presented by Clemens Home Solutions and Heritage Funeral Care.